Thank you for joining us. I'm John Richter, president of Friends of the Jordan River Watershed. Friends of the Jordan is a conservation and environmental group located in northwest lower Michigan. The program you're about to see is on a subject that will affect every person in Michigan and something we all need to learn a lot more about before irreparable harm is done to our homes, communities, and environment. This subject is called fracking, or more accurately, deep shale slick water hydrologic fracking. It's a new method of extracting natural gas. A couple of years ago, after watching a commercial by T. Boone Pickens announcing vast reserves of natural gas right here in America, I was encouraged. At last, I thought, here was an abundant fossil fuel that burned cleaner than coal, could end our dependence on foreign oil, and provide good jobs for American workers. Then I learned about the devastating industrial scale process used to extract this natural gas, the effects it had on communities and the environment, and that it was being sold overseas. Now I'm not only discouraged, but alarmed. We have seen the environmental destruction fracking has caused in other states, and now it's come to Michigan. We think Michigan has far too much to lose by allowing this method of gas extraction to continue. But first, we, under, we need to understand how fracking works and what its true costs are. A series of videos we have prepared are segments of a two-hour presentation by Dr. Anthony Ingrafia from Cornell University. Dr. Ingrafia is a world-renowned expert on natural gas extraction and provides us with a sound scientific explanation of fracking. This video should be well worth your time to watch. You can find much more information on this subject on our website at friendsofthejordan.org or another don'tfrackmichigan.org. Thanks for watching. Dispelling of myths. Okay. So, the most important myth that I want to dispel is the following. Since 1947, over 1.4 million gas and oil wells in the United States have been hydraulically fractured. What's the big bus about and fuss about this one? Why is this different? Why is what's happening in a Marcellus different? Is it? And the answer is yes. And I have to explain to you why it is substantially different. What we're talking about is not conventional gas development, we're talking about unconventional gas development. Well, what's in that word? Everything. So I have to tell you why it's unconventional. And I have to tell you that it would be technically and financially inadvisable for an operator to try to produce gas from an unconventional source like the Marcellus if that operator had not acquired relatively recently four technologies and combine them. So unconventional gas development from shales is a relatively recent enterprise, fewer than 15 years old, the result of American enterprise that combined four separate technologies in a way that unlocked unconventional gas shale. Okay, so this has not been going on since 1947. It's an entirely different beast and I'm about to show you why. What are the four technologies? I'll describe them with pictures and with words. So first, directional drilling. Uh, back in the 80s when we were working on this, we meaning I with Schlumberger, we called it deviated well bores. But that has certain overtones. <laughs> so it later became directional drilling. Directional drilling means that you can drill a hole in any direction you want. Not necessarily vertical, not necessarily horizontal, but literally in any direction you want. Not just one curve, but multiple curves. Whatever the technology and the geology let you get away with, you can do it. Well, why is that one of the four necessary technologies needed to unlock unconventional gas? I'll use a cartoon you've all seen before from geology.com. It's a cartoon. It's not to scale. Uh, where we're sitting right now, the Marcellus is probably six to 7,000 feet down. So this is six to 7,000 feet. But the thickness of the shale layer known as Marcellus is only a few hundred feet. 
So maybe 10 times the height of this room. So why would you go through the bother of drilling a hole seven or 8,000 feet down and your well is only gonna come in contact with your resource for a few hundred feet? That doesn't seem like a good thing to do unless all the gas down there is in one pocket. So if all the gas was right here, stored in one big pocket, all you need is a vertical well to punch through it. That's conventional gas development. But that's not what's down there. The gas that's down there is everywhere in the shale. It's not, con it's not confined into one pocket, into a grobin, into a trap, like it is in sandstones and limestones. But in shale, the gas is relatively uniformly distributed throughout that layer of rock. That direction, that direction, that direction, and that direction. So if you drill a vertical hole and you only expose the well to a few hundred feet, you're only going to get the gas out of a few hundred feet of, get, few hundred feet of rock. With directional drilling, you can turn and go in any direction the rock is going. It might be horizontal, it might not be. Whatever direction the geology says the rock is going, that's the direction you go. And you can go a long way. So engineers don't like to use words like tall, short, long, fast. We always try to make sure we know what we're talking about. Long means a mile. Two miles? What's the record right now? In, in any, is there a shale formation anywhere in the world where there are two mile laterals? Yes. In Pennsylvania, the record right now is about 7,400 feet, a mile and a half. So what that means is you now have a well that has long exposure to the inventory. The inventory is where you have your product. The product of a gas operator is gas. The inventory is everywhere, therefore you have to go everywhere to get it. Got that? So you can see why directional drilling is important because of the geology, the shale layer is thin, and because of the way nature put the gas in the shale, it's everywhere. Go back to the second technology. High frac fluid volumes. Conventional gas wells typically use less than 100,000 gallons of fracturing fluid. Now, for those of you who don't know anything about fracturing, you might think 100,000 is a big number. But as we proceed tonight, you're going to see 100,000 is a very small number, <laughs> unless it's the amount of money in your checking account. So uh, high volume in New York State is defined as anything over 300,000 gallons. And as you'll see later in the talk, typically for unconventional shale wells, we're talking millions of gallons of frac fluid. Why? Well, because we can drill through a mile, a mile and a half, or two miles of shale, we have a really long well. The well could be three or four miles long. Just to get all that fluid down there takes a lot. Fill up a, a pipe that's only six inches in diameter that's three miles long still takes a lot of fluid. But you're trying to create many, 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 or recreate many, many fractures. I'll show you a picture of what I mean. Okay, up in New York State, we have lots of gorges. You've all heard the phrase Ithaca is gorgeous. Or gorges, which one is it? It's both. Okay, if you walk through any of the gorges around Ithaca, you can see exposed shale layers, including black shale layers. So this is a picture from the bottom of a Tagonic Gorge. And this is a black shale layer, and you notice those are natural fractures. They're called joints. The geologists would call them joints. They're really fractures that have occurred because of natural geological processes. You've also heard that shale is impermeable. The industry says, here's another myth, it's impossible for what's down there to get up here because there are many layers of impermeable rock between down there and up here. There's no such thing as impermeability. There's only scales of impermeability. But it is true that the Marcellus rock itself, I had a piece of Marcellus rock in my hand. Say I took a piece right out of the middle of that block. It's relatively impermeable. That means that fluids do not want to flow through it very easily. It's not like the sponge in your kitchen that has all those big holes in it and all those holes are interconnected. So if you pour water in the top of the sponge, it comes out the bottom. So the holes in the shale are microscopic and they're not connected. So fluid, liquid or gas, does not want to flow through that rock very easily. In fact, it might take a molecule of gas in the middle of that block years to get to the nearest crack, joint. But since it's been down here for 390 million years, a lot of that gas has gotten to those joints. So most of the readily available gas in the Marcellus is not in the Marcellus. Oh, here goes in graphia with those conundrums. 
Most of the gas in the Marcellus is not in the Marcellus. It's in the joints in the Marcellus. Because that's where it wants to go. And that's where it's easy to stay stored for somebody to come and take it away. So another misnomer, another myth. Hydraulic fracturing is not fracturing, it's refracturing because there are already fractures. The purpose of hydraulic fracturing is not to create new fractures, it's to open up the existing fractures. Why? Because that's where the gas is. Got it? Okay, so why do we need high volumes? Well, let's put our, our imaginary mile and a half long lateral, right? Imagine that's a mile and a half. How many of these joints are we going to intercept if there's a joint every two feet? Thousands of them. And how much fluid do we have to put in those joints to open them up for hundreds of feet in each direction? Even though we're only opening those joints, how much? How much, do, how much are we opening these joints? Are we creating cracks this wide down there? This wide? This wide? A little bit more than the diameter of a grain of sand. But when you've got acres and acres of cracks open the width of a grain of sand, it takes a lot of fluid. So, second technology that had to be invented was the ability to bring to a site high volumes, to store high volumes on a site, and to inject high volumes. That takes a hell of a lot of horsepower. Again, there's one of those engineering words, hell of a. Okay. <laughs> thousands of horsepower of pumps. This is not your pressure washer for your deck. Okay, we're talking thousands of horsepower needed to pump those high frac fluid volumes down two or three miles along a pipe that ultimately is only the, the casing, the production casing, the stuff that's down there on the lateral through which the gas is going to flow back. What's the diameter of that pipe? Four to six inches. Okay, so here we go with my favorite analogy. Garden hose. You connect your garden hose to your faucet. Is the rate at which the water comes out the end of the garden hose the same as the rate at which it comes out of the faucet? Yes or no? No. <laughs> if you make your hose long enough, what comes out the other end? Nothing. Why? Friction. So there's pressure loss and flow loss as you're trying to force a fluid through a hose just like there is as you're trying to force a large volume of fluid, millions of gallons, through a six inch diameter pipe over three miles at what pressure? 6,000 pounds per square inch. Or more, depends upon the geology and the depth, up to 10,000 pounds per square inch. So you need a lot of horsepower to do that. Okay. I'll show you a picture later on where there's 40,000 aggregate horsepower involved in one frack job. Okay. But now we've invented another problem. We took these two technologies, directional drilling gets us long exposure, ability to inject high volumes of fluid over long distances through small diameter pipes in a relatively brief period of time at very high pressures. Friction, we gotta make the water slick. That's where the slick water name comes from. You have to lubricate the water, which is a concept that most people think is crazy. Isn't water slippery? It is when it's frozen, <laughs> okay. Um, water is inherently slippery, but it's not slippery enough. <coughs> Same thing with the water going through your garden hose. So someone had, some chemists working for gas companies had to invent chemicals that they could add to water that effectively reduce the friction of the water passing through the casing, and in fact reduces the friction between the water molecules themselves. It's like lubricating your automobile engine, right? So that was the th next technology. You can't get all that high fluid volume at the high pressure down that long pipe of small diameter in a relatively short period of time unless you reduce friction and that's slick water. Okay. Fourth technology, multi-well pads. A pad, as you know, is an area where there is drilling and fracking going on. A number of acres that have been cleared, industrialized. Conventional wells typically have one well per pad. Why? I just told you the answer. It's all in the geology and how the gas is stored. Why do you only need one well on a pad? Because it's either down there or it's not. <laughs> it makes no sense to drill one well here and then move 10 feet away and drill another one. You might want to move a mile away because you missed. You got a dry hole, right? You thought there was gas down there. You didn't get it. But where's the gas in the Marcellus? Everywhere. So if you're going to go through the effort of clearing an area and setting up shop with heavy industrial activity where you're going to drill a well, <coughs> in that direction, why not drill another one in that direction? And then move 17 feet and drill another one in that direction and another one in that direction. And then move 17 feet, excuse me, I'm getting close here. 
and do that until economically you say, well, I've gotten the most out of this one pad, I'll move on to another pad. So the idea of drilling more than one well from a pad, again, is dictated by the geology, the gas is everywhere, and dictated by economics, and controlled by whom? Gas companies, and DEP, and who's leasing the land? Y'all, <laughs> right? So if a gas company wants to come and put a pad here and drill eight or nine wells that way, eight or nine wells that way, that's gonna be a pretty big pad and it's gonna take up a lot of land underground. It's gonna drain a large area, square miles. And they have to have permission from landowners to do that or they have to not get permission and still do it, depending upon the laws of the land. It depends upon whether you're in New York State or Pennsylvania. Okay? So, those four technologies are recent, relatively recent. None of those technologies was around in 1947, when hydrofracking first became available. The vast majority of the gas and oil wells that have been fracked in Pennsylvania were fracked conventionally. All the gas and oil wells in New York were fracked conventionally. So how old are these technologies? This is data from the New York State Supplemental, Supplemental Generic Environmental Impact Statement. Okay, uh, this is a table, so it's not mine. Let's see, slick water fracturing fluids introduced, 1996. That's not 1947, that's a myth. We don't frack Marcellus wells with traditional fracking materials, gel fracking, gel gas fracking, sometimes hybrid fracking, yes, but usually slick water. Not always, but most of the time. Uh, Multi-stage slick water fracturing of horizontal wells. Oh, combined slick water, high volume, and a horizontal well. 2002, down into Barnett. The first hydraulic fracturing of the Marcella Shale, Pennsylvania, 2003, Washington County. And finally, use of multi-well pads and cluster drilling, Pennsylvania, 2007. So this is all relatively recent. It's not, a myth is that the industry will say, we've been doing this for millions of times, over 60 years, what's the hubbub? The hubbub is it's relatively new technology. You're still inventing it. You're still evolving it. It's still an industrial process that has yet to reach a steady state operating procedure because every well is gonna be different and every formation is gonna be different and capital and leasing control what they do. This is going to be a constantly evolving technology. This will never be a technology in which a building goes into your, zone, your industrial zone and you build toasters. Same thing over and over and over again. It's constantly going to evolve because that's what Mother Nature is going to force the industry to do. All these were natural evolutions in response to geology and gas distribution. Got it? Now we know what we're talking about. Unconventional gas development. Large volumes very large volumes, 100 times more than previously used. Multi-well pads, horizontal drilling, necessary to add different chemicals to the fracturing fluid than we've used before because of requirements of that massive hydraulic fracturing process. Okay. So that's what the hubbub is about. Now we're saying, you, I, maybe, we're all saying, well, is that, is that new technology safe enough for us? Are the risks acceptable? Because it's a new technology. 